Yeah. You don't get any break. Yeah. Alex. Yeah. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. And you have a quiz today. Yeah. Of what, <laughs> what is example? These are some exercises which you can do oh, well, probably so after the tutorial. So this exercise will oh, okay. fit to the content of the tutorial. Um, or can support some results. Actually, there are some formulas which are quite long. I don't want to write them down if I have time to discuss something about that. Uh, so I need that. So are there actually some online uh, attendant persons? Yeah, okay. Good. Oh, 11. So I don't know if, if I also will use that board, if this is too small. This board? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. We, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do Okay. You have the mic there. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, the last talk of the second day is Alex is going to tell us a little bit more exercises and and the tutorial about the first mini course. Done by Ryan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it was a long day today and a lot of long talks. So I can just stop at a certain point. Um, but I will talk today about yeah, very specific matrix models, which um, has shown up in Reimer's talk today. So let's uh, define, okay, HN I say is the space of Hermitian met N times N, N times N matrices. And then we look at the partition function Z to the K of some J. This J was actually in Reimer's talk, the F. So this source term, where we have an integral over the Hermitian matrices, the M of the exponential minus N trace of E M squared plus lambda over k m to the k minus j m. Okay, these are the partition functions we are interested in, which are somehow related or can be deduced from non commutative geometry if you have this capital omega being one and so on, all this stuff. Um, so in the tutorial, we say this capital N is the size of the matrices for Reimer. It was related to this non-commutative parameter theta and so on. We can all play this game, but uh, here I want to have it, everything a little bit easier. And we just say capital N is the size of the N times N matrices. So lambda is the coupling constant, some positive real number, let's say. Then we have also J and E, they are Hermitian matrices. And we say E can be chosen diagonal with the eigenvalues. E has the eigenvalues EI where the pair was different because then everything is a little bit easier, but actually we can do that they are equal and all these definitions actually can work, but it's quite technical and ugly. Um, and we have two specific cases, which are interesting now, where we have K is equal to three. If we have k is equal to three, and let's say j is zero, 
then we have the conservage model. Uh, we heard it a few times, or it was mentioned. Uh, it's a very important model in topological recursion as well. And it's solved by topological recursion. If k is equal to three, we have the conservage model. Um, so we have here e m squared plus some coupling constant over three m to the three. So we are, you have just, uh, I guess you know all this uh, from random matrix model, you have just triangulations. You have rim graphs with three valent vertices, or if you think of maps, you have triangulations, which have additional weights coming here from this. Yeah. No, 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 no. Then you have to take lambda. It's imaginary, purely imaginary, for instance. And I talk here about formal matrix models and not convergent matrix models. Okay. Yeah, I think it was imaginary. Yeah, 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 yeah it was imaginary. So yeah, but okay. Let's say some parameter lambda. In a complex, <laughs> because we talk about formal things, and this is probably then okay. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the definition of a formal matrix model that you write a formal power series of this thing, and then you pull out the series of the integral. This is the definition of a formal matrix model. Okay, and the case. So this is the which model in the case k equal four correspond to the grosse Wolkenhammer model. And this is actually the matrix model with Reimers working on the case where k is equal four. And the point is that this case or this model with k equal four is completely different from the model with k equal three. And I try to yeah, explain a little bit why they are so different. Uh, try to compute Dyson-Schwinger equations is a, if I have enough time for the case k equal three and k equal four, we can combine them or compare them um, and what comes out. So a little bit technical or definitions, I say S int, which is the interacting part. Um, also of K will be of M is N trace lambda over K M to the K. And then it was already mentioned a lot of times that if we take derivatives of this object with respect to this source matrix with respect to J, we get just some M here down, and this is a quite very useful trick and we will use this trick a lot of times. So probably I can uh, just write it down that if you have certain derivatives with respect to J, A, B, or even if you have a certain function of it, of J, K, J, it's nothing else than the integral D, M, and they of the same function of, uh, one over m, m, and then I guess I has to switch indices b, a, and x of all the rest. So this is kind of the trick. Um, good. And then, and another trick is the following that we use this. This, that we can just write everything which is here in front, or even if we take this interaction out of this exponential, write a second exponential here with the interaction and it's not here anymore. We can use again this trick and see that the partition function can also be written as some constant the exponential of minus s int of one over n 
derivative with respect to the source term times the exponential of nm n over two j n m j m n over e n plus e m. So this comes from this trick that we can actually write this whole integral over m. So first of all, what we do, we use this trick writing everything, every part of this interaction with respect to uh, derivatives, with respect to this j's. Pull this out of the integral. Then we have just uh, a Gaussian integral because we have E m squared minus J m. Then you can do the yeah transform or do the Gaussian integral. It gives you something which is included in this constant. You can write it explicitly down, but you have to complete the square, which gives you this part here. There's no sign. So this is one of the exercises just compute this, show that this is equal to this. Um, okay, and then we have already seen in the Reimer's talk, the definition of the correlation function we're interested in. So the correlation function, they were called capital G, let's say of a genus G, directly we have a genus expansion, where we have this vertical lines indexed by A1 a one two so this is not an exponent this is also a subscript a superscript and a subscript up to a one n one and then okay the second one i can write it also down a two one a two two and so on up to a n two and then everybody should guess how it will work and the last last one is a b one to a b n b and this object is defined as uh, 2g plus b minus 2 through the derivatives n1 to n b over delta then we have here j 1 1 j 1 2 and so on then we have here a cycle a1, n1, a1, 1. So this is this cycle. Then we have a second one and third one. And the last one is uh, with respect to B, B, A, B1, A, B2, and so on. A, B, N, B1. Of the log of Z, J, let's say K at J is equal to zero. So this is the definition of our expectation values, which we are interested in. So we have seen it today a lot of times that we look at this joint cycle. So all the A, I, J are pairwise distinct. So we are producing here B cycles, each one is of length n i, capital N i. And um, yeah, this is quite natural thing to look at in quantum field theory. And actually we have also seen this object today in the talk of Elba because this is also related to fully simple maps. They are also defined by disjoint cycles, which actually coincide with our definition if we have E the identity. So if E will be, I mean, I said they are all different eigenvalues, but you can do this game a little bit more general or later. Actually, our results coincide with fully simple maps if we choose E the identity after complexification, obviously. So this is also a relation to, or some connection to fully simple maps. Okay, is there any question? Yeah, G is the correlation function. I mean, this is the 2.5. I call this n one plus and so on plus n b point function. So for example, what, okay, the aim is here to compute for the two point function, which is G a one one a one, uh, 
2. This is the two point function. So you have one bound, so you have one cycle of length 2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you want to go then to, to the non commutative space back and so on, this is more complicated, but yeah. Yeah. So this is somehow the two point function. And I try to compute, do together the Dyson Schwing equation for this function. So, but you can do it completely general. More questions? So, on the other hand, what we can also do is using this definition, expanding the log z of uh, log of j as some um, sums, it's quite technical, over some sums and so on of this g's with all these indices and so on times this j's. So this is equivalently just to write it here out, right? With some symmetry factors and, uh, and so on and so on. It's a long formula. I don't know if I wrote it. Can I have one of these exercise sheets? Do you have one left? Yes, no, here. Probably I wrote it. Uh, uh, no, unfortunately not. Okay, good. Yeah, the log gives you the connected part. This is the connected part. Because otherwise, if I don't take the log, you have all probably disconnected. Yeah, and this is also what Weimar today talked. If you go from the disconnected parts to the connected parts where you have the sum over all partitions and all this stuff also appears there. This is, I mean, completely general. Okay, this was some of the setup, recalling some definitions. Good, I will keep... Um, this thing and then we try to compute or manipulate just the two point function in a certain way and do some calculation tricks Okay, just now we are computing the Dyson Schwinger equation. So, so here's also the K which says or denotes which kind of interaction we have K3 or K4. So we can do First of all, probably the case K equal three. And actually in the case where we have K equal three in the conservative model, we have also one point function because you can have TED poles and all this stuff. So by definition, we have G A. So one cycle length one is the derivative log C three j d j a a with some one over n and then you use this yeah that we can rewrite the partition function in this way you can pull out k you can pull out actually all this exponential with respect to this derivatives because all these derivatives just commute so we have then k over n exponential of this s int of these derivatives of j. And then you act with this one new derivative, d j a a on this part here. So I call this, so in our paper, we call it usually z free of J, because it's the only part which just depends on J. And then what comes down, you get just one J A A, because if this derivative X either here, it fixes N and M to A and A, 
this thing comes down or you can also act here then this will come down and this cancels the two so and also we get in the denominator ea plus ea of yeah z3 or oh, here sorry j equals zero of course j. this is the first step uh, and the next step will be that we have to move this exponential of the interaction of the derivatives through this j to this side to reconstruct by definition the correlation functions and how does it work so there's also one exercise about that so if we have so where's the exercise so this is the exercise probably five so if we have an exponential of some polynomial so formally defined of some derivatives acting on some kind of function x times g of x just gives you the derivative of this polynomial at this yeah at this derivatives e f of b uh, x so you can pull this or you you let act this thing here which gives you just one derivative of f and then you have still need the other derivatives on g plus x e f dx g so this is something in the exercise which you can prove and what does it mean here so if you try to commute this thing with this thing you can either commute it completely so you just pull it there or you let act it here once where you take one derivative of this interaction which comes down but the x but here's no x in front right but the this j will vanish so this will give you then so i don't want to do any typos lambda because remember s int okay was of m in the case of k equal three lambda over 3m to the 3, probably there was a 1n in front and we have to trace. So there's one lambda coming here, ea plus ea, which was also before. Then we have here this n, 1 over n. Then we can actually form 1z0 because we are taking the log, right? And now you have 1 over actually here here was also already one c of zero sorry i forgot it um and then from this trace over so we have to take here the derivative of the interaction which is the kind of m to the three so the derivative will be kind of m to the two but instead of m we insert derivatives with respect to j so we have here then a sum over d squared d a m d m a where we sum over m coming from this trace so it's like if you take the derivative of m a of s int something like uh lambda over three oh, this three cancels times m sum over m m a m m m a right and this will also come here where we write instead of the m's the derivative with respect to j and then we have pulled this in front of this derivative so because we have then here this is corresponds to x minus s int this is acting here and the k is just a constant we can also move it here and then can we can reform j not free the complete j k is equal to three j at j equals zero and the lima 
And this calculation trick was today by Weimar, how do you call them? Um, the, uh, yeah, the equation of motion. This were the one slide, the equation of motions was exactly this trick. Coming from this trick, you get the equation of motions. This is a typical thing which you do in quantum field theory. And so, yeah, but probably not everything learned as techniques in quantum field theory. And then you form, uh, you let act this here, and then you form by definition, again, the correlation functions. So I had the log of Z or Z even, gives you the, the, the correlation functions. And here you should be a little bit careful, but what happens is then that you get either the two-point function, which is the connected part. So G A M plus or something of higher genus, where you have one over N squared. Um, you can form two cycles where if M is equal to A, this will form one cycle and this will form one cycle. This is this part. Or because we look at the action of the derivatives on the partition function, not on the logarithm, we get also disconnected things, which gives you G, A, G, A. Um, okay, and this is, First of all, the Dyson Schwinger equation. It's the same as in quantum field theory, you have some endpoint function depending on some higher point function. So the one point function depends on the two point function, first of all. If you play the same game for the two point function, it will depend on the three point function, and so on and so on. So you get a tower of equation, but we want to solve it. And we can solve this tower by using this word identities of Weimar today explained a bit. Um, Yeah, it is essentially, it is just integration by parts. Yeah, but this is essentially integration by parts. Yeah, not now, I have not talked about that. So I will derive the word Takashi identity to replace this thing back by the one point function. So the two point function is replaced by the one point function. And then you have a closed equation for the one point function. Um, we can, here's another chalk. So if we play, probably, I mean, we understood now the procedure. If we play the same game with K equal four, we have to start with G A B, I call it is given by second derivative log four J plus one N, I guess, yeah. A B B J B A. So we have one cycle of length two. So A is not equal to B at J is equal zero. We play the same game. We let one derivative act on the Z free one j comes down, you want to pull this in front of the j once one part is acting here. But for the two point function, also the free propagator contributes. So I will not do the whole derivation. We get Ea plus Eb. This is the free propagator. Then so this is actually if we would put lambda equal zero and so on, we have this Gaussian case. This is the free propagator, which, which is here minus lambda EA plus EB. And then what enters here is NM G A B N M where the four point function comes in. So one cycle of length four. And then you have several choices. If one of these n's is equal to A or M is equal to B or N is equal to A and M is equal to B. There are a lot of different choices. You can build different cycles. Um, how much will I write down? So let's say just the genus uh, 
zero contribution plus uh, GAB. Let's write in this way, one over N, sum over N, GAN plus GBN. Um, sorry. Yeah, plus some higher order terms with N, N squared, which are long and ugly. So, but th this is some of the genus zero contribution. So it depends on the four. So this is the case K equal four. This depends on the four point function and the two point function. And actually for this um, Dyson Schwinger equation, there is a completely yeah, nice and natural graphical description. So we look at ribbon graphs, so the perturbative expansion is ribbon graph. But how do you interpret this equation is the following. So we have here the one point function, usually written in uh, physics notation as uh, if you shed this circle, you have one external leg. It gives you, um, you have here just because we have m to the three, just a vertex of valence three. And then you connect it here. Again, it was a two point function. This is this part. This is this part. Where we label here the edges of this rim by A going once around again A. Here we label this edge by A. So you have to follow, this is the Feynman rule. You have to follow them back A. And the other side of this edge is M and we have to sum over M. So this is like in physics, you sum over closed loops. Plus, let's look at this part. This goes like, we have the ribbon. It splits again with this vertex. The vertex correspond to this factor of lambda, um, to a one-point function and a one-point function. And just for curiosity, here we have higher genus contribution. It would look like, uh, actually, I guess it's hard to draw. So we have here like, like an annulus. This connects here. And then we have connection to the inner circle. And both of them are indexed by A and A. So we have here an A. And here, eh? and if we follow this edge here, then we follow it here. So we have here also the A. We follow it here inside. So we have here inside also the A. And go back and have here also the A. So it works completely out. Completely, it works out completely if we follow just the edges. And this is actually what you have if you go one genus less. Okay, and also here, you can draw the same game with these graphs. You have the two point function. It's given by the free propagator. This is uh, this part here, one over EA plus EB. Plus, so the free propagator just appears for the two point function. Um, now we have vertices of valence four. Here, this goes with lambda because we have k is equal to four, which means we have here the vertices of valence four. Then we have here the four point function entering. This is uh, this part. Where we have here the A, here's the B, and A and B comes out. And this four point function have here A, B, N, and M. So we sum again over this closed faces here. Plus we can have uh, this term, it's of the form. Here, so we have A going here A, then we have here N, here's the vertex, which gives you the lambda. And here we have A and B. So we have vertex give you the lambda in front. This prefactor actually is also the free propagator, which corresponds to this edge or to this 
free propagator here. Then this bubble gives you this thing, and this bubble GAB gives you this thing, plus the same. Just symmetric. Yeah. So this is the graphical understanding of this Dyson Schwinger equations in terms of rim graphs. Okay. Good. And yeah, the aim is then to replace one of these parts because we see we have here the two point function. It depends on the four point function. If we want to compute the four point function or the Dyson Schwinger equation, it will depend on the six point function in this case, and so on and so on. And we want to get rid of the higher point function in the Dyson Schwinger equation. And this is done by the word identity. Okay. As Weimar said, first computed by Rivasso, Di Sartori, and one or two other people. I, I don't know. Razvan Guru, who will talk tomorrow or the day after. Yes. And Good. Okay, I want to keep probably this. I also want to keep this and this. Um, uh, I can go to this board, I guess, right? So now, is it fine if I write here? Is yeah. Okay. If I, now the next thing is the word identity. So Raima showed the word identity. I just write it down. It's also on the on the exercise sheet, EA minus EB over N, we have a sum over N, M squared DJ, A, M, E, J, M, B, Z, K, J is equal to sum over M, J, M, A, J, M, B minus, D, B, M, D, D, A, M, acting also on D, J, K. So this identity acts on the full partition function, not just on the free energy, not on the log of the partition function, but on the full partition function. And you don't have to take uh, J at zero. So this holds for any J, this equation. And what you can see is that you, can go down. You have a second derivative and you can go effectively two steps down. So you get one J and one derivative with respect to J. So you get effectively two steps down, which means you can go probably from the four point function to the two point function. Or you can go from the three point function then to the one point function, I guess. Yeah, or also from the two point function because some of it also to the one point function. Um, good. How do we prove it? Probably just some, 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 yeah, some ideas. But it works actually on the same trick as we derived the Dyson Schwinger equation. It's actually essentially the same trick, partial integration, more or less. So let's look at the left hand side. What we can do on the left hand side here, so the proof. So there are two ways of proving it. The one proposed by Rivasso and his collaborators by a unitary transformation of the partition function, which gives you some identity, which is exactly this one. Or you can compute it directly with this um, integration by parts. And I think this is probably nicer. So we put here a zero. We write EA plus EM minus EM minus. E, right? Just put plug in here zero. Um, then we divide everything by n. Let's forget this sum at the moment. We do it for any m. Second derivative dj a m dj m a acting on z k j. Then we write the partition function again in this form, we can pull out all this derivative of this interaction part to the left. And then we can act, we do the following just to we EA plus EM. Um, 
Um, let's write it in this way. Am djmb minus and then we have the other term and also this two derivatives we have r or here is the k and over n and all this exponential of this minus uh, the interaction and here we have also the second derivative i've just rewritten everything And what I'm now doing is for this term, I will let act this derivative on Z free, right? Because, and if we act on Z free, one of them will come down, but with the prefactor. So this action will give you a prefactor one over EM plus EA, which cancel exactly this term. For this term, I act with the other derivative, which gives you the prefactor EM plus EB, which cancels exactly this term. And then you have just to um, look what happens with the rest. So exactly what comes down is one J and one derivative survives. So it gives you first of all, something like JMA derivative jmb minus jmb b over d j m a and then you can reform the partition function plus a lot of other terms coming from when the interaction um they're coming from the inter coming from this partial integration from the interaction. So we have here also some ds int um, with respect to dma of the dj's d djm d minus ds int d mba of the derivative of, of J, J, A, M, acting on the partial uh, on the partition function, and if we sum now on this side and on this side over M, this term here cancels exactly. If we sum over M and sum here over M, but here it makes no difference, so we can plug this here in or leave it here, cancel all the zeros. And this is then exactly the water identity. It's like this one calculation trick. So let's use it probably now. I want to use it. Left time, yeah. Dyson Schwinger plus water identity gives you closed Dyson Schwinger equation in the large n limit. So, so I need the genus expansion as well. Just that, then. This is the last step. Because I have here the higher order thing, they will still contribute even if I use the water identity. But if I do the genus expansion and look at fixed genus, you will have closed Dyson Schwinger equation. Yeah, yeah, you have to take it here as well. So for instance, I cannot get rid of this term here in this example. I can get rid of this term, but not of this term. And they're also of this order, higher order. Um, yeah. Okay, let's do it for, what is here for? Let's use it for K equal three. We have G for the two point function. We're interested in the two point function. Second derivative J A B J B A one over N and then uh, we do again all this, this the same trick as we uh, derived the Dyson Schwinger equation, which gives you then one over 
you see first of all here the free propagator because we have two point functions minus lambda over e a plus e b and then you get here one over n d zero d e j a b so i have left i let this part acting here on z free pulling this back doing this calculation trick uh, and so on and then two derivatives comes down uh, which is b m m a um, on z j at j is equal zero and for this part here we use exactly the word identity we use that the second derivative is written as j of one derivative j of one derivative we divide by this part and get here um yeah the free propagator eb and we have still here something like one over n z of zero this one derivative still there a b of sum over m m b b m a minus j uh, a m B M acting on Z of C at J is equal to zero. And now we have one derivative here in front, one J here, another derivative here. So this derivative uh, has to act on this part because otherwise everything vanishes after taking J is equal to zero. So this acts here where it fixes the M to be A or it acts here where it fixes the b at the end to be b so you will have then and then you just form again the uh by definition the correlation function so one derivative is this derivative so why is where m is equal to a so what survives is then blah 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 all the stuff where we have d over d j a a minus d over d j b b acting on z at z is equal to zero and which gives you nothing else oh i forgot here sorry we have to divide by e a minus e b because this comes from this factor we have to divide by that divide by e a minus e b and this gives you nothing else than the free propagator. Ah. Nothing than the free propagator what was still there, minus lambda over EA plus EB times GA minus GB over e a minus e b so we write completely the two-point function it's just the free propagator minus here something and uh differential difference quotient of the one-point function so in the this is the computation in the case k equal three it's very easy so we can write actually any endpoint function just by the difference quotient of an n minus one point function in k equal three it's very simple yeah actually quite completely trivial but this changes completely for the case k equal four so i um i don't know how detailed i will uh, Okay, I don't probably I don't do the computation in detail, but for k equal four, it's much more complicated, and you do the same 
procedure where we will have, because it's an action on Z, not on the log of Z, all this um, word identity. And then we will have the following that one or N sum G A B C M sum over M here is given by G A B minus G C B over E C minus E A. So this is the what identity giving us uh, we have here one cycle of length four of C B. Okay, so we can write now I unfortunately deleted something here. And so we can write a product of two point function plus a sum over one index as a uh, difference quotient of two point functions, which means that we can replace this term and one of them by this relation. This one will be, will still be there. And the word identity will then give us one over EA plus EB minus lambda over A plus EB. Uh, GAB one over N, let's keep probably this one, GBN. The other two are replaced by uh, the word identity minus sum over M, where if you N, sum over N, G, a, okay, now I have to be careful. I sum or I don't want to mess up the indices. Uh, why not correct me if I'm not? It's the other index. Here's the B. Okay. All right, let's write it probably in this way A and B, A, B, divided by E, N minus E, B. This is the right one, right? No, 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 it's uh, the other one because he, I have here the sum of a BN and there's the other one, right? Well, I can also keep, I can also write here AN. So then I'll do it for the, for this term and this term. It's the same. But, but the important point is that actually the two point function is symmetric. And if you interchange A and B, this first Dyson Schwinger equation is a symmetric function or it's also symmetric if you understand change A and B, but after applying the what identity, you get a non-symmetric function in A and B, which is actually much easier to, to use instead of the symmetric function. So this is also a very important uh, observation here. Okay, this is actually what I wanted to do. We have still time or oh, probably it's not, not really. So actually, um, maybe I can just comment on something. So we can also do uh, this. I mean, here I use the word identity to write a two point function in terms of the one point function. We can play the same game in K equal to four. This was for K equal to three. It gives you much more involved recursive algebraic relations for correlation function. And they have a very interesting um, interpretation. So we have just probably one example. We can write, it's, is it on the sheet, uh, on the exercise sheet? No, on the exercise sheet is a complicated one. So the last, the very last equation or relation on the exercise sheet is for G equals zero and just one cycle, A1 up to AN given by G zero A two K plus two uh, plus two. Yeah, up to A N one. Is it P one? Does it make sense? No, A one times G 
a2 up to a 2k1 minus okay some more g and some more g with some indices is not important and here you have e a 2k plus one minus e a1 e a2 minus e a n so in a situation where k was equal to three we wrote the two-point function in terms of the one-point function in the case where k is equal to four so the gloss of Wolkenheim model we write an endpoint function given by a product of smaller point function. So this is nonlinear, the re algebraic recursive relation. And this is a linear relation. This is completely different. And if you want to, I mean, you can apply this relation recursively. So we sum here over K from something. You can apply then again here and here and here and here. And then the question is, what is the explicit explicitly given relation of an endpoint function just in terms of two-point function because they're the basic building blocks right what is an endpoint function giving in two-point functions and actually this was a quite interesting um, combinatorial problem for us so we had here a result so it's a paper with uh Reimer Wolkenhaar and Jens de Jong also former PhD student and with me that we found that actually this problem is given by, we call it nested Catalan numbers or a nested Catalan problem, not Catalan square, but a kind of Catalan inside a Catalan problem. I probably just draw a picture. What do I mean with nested Catalan problem? So there are also two Catalan problems, but not multiplied. They're nested. So the Catalan numbers, you can have the problem where we have here your, we had it NC2 of 2N, right? Where you have here this chord diagram. Oh, oh my gosh. Let's look at this. This is one example, right? Of a chord, a non-crossing diagram. This is given by, I don't know how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12. 12. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we have here n is equal to seven. So we have 14. So seven edges. <laughs> and we have inside each of these boxes, or we call it pockets, we have here one, two, three, four, five. Again, a Catalan problem described by, I guess this is C4, right? By Catalan or not five. And here we have described by a further Catalan problem which is given then here by this planar trees and uh, here, here as well. And it's sitting here inside and here inside. So we have a Catalan problem where the, uh, the pockets are again described by the Catalan problem. So, and uh, uh, the cardinality of this problem, oh, I actually don't know. We have somehow, so these are the Catalan numbers. So we have something like the Catalan numbers of the Catalan numbers. Uh, how to write it, E0, we had it up to C, or we had here, something like that, right? I don't remember. E, N, where, oh, I don't remember the notation we had. We had, we have defined the notation, but if you count the cardinality of this problem, it was given by one over two N plus one, probably three N over N or N plus one. Something like this is a, also quite interesting uh, problem. Probably, yeah, probably does. Yeah. Yeah, pro probably does, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but the point is, this is the easiest example of this um algebraic recursive equation just for genus zero one boundary cyclic but we have this we have all the recursive relations for any genus for any number of boundaries which is quite complicated but it's the last equation on the on the exercise sheet and then is the question what does it mean in this picture do we have some kind of more general higher genus nested versions of catalan numbers i don't know it's also uh, yeah it's not it does not factorize actually 
it's more complicated. I don't know if you mean by change the kind of factorization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but this is the uh, change of one length. Yeah, probably there are some. I mean. If, uh, if you have some nice references and we can construct some bijection to from this problem to another problem, this would be great. But we have also higher genus recursive relation, which can give us higher genus versions of everything. Yeah. But yeah, this is actually what I wanted to say. Okay, yeah. If you have any question, please ask questions because this is actually what the tutorial is for. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I mean, yeah, this is a completely different thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, there is a paper of NR where you, yeah. So for any spectral curve and topological recursion, you can give a relation to intersection numbers. You can do that for any arbitrary spectral curve. And there are some spectral curves which are very nice and give you just this number. Um, this is also one uh, question or one project, which kind of intersection numbers can you quali uh, Yeah, can you say something about them in the Klaus of Wolkenheim model? We don't know at the moment, but also, what Reimer will actually say tomorrow that the Gross Wolkenheim model does not fit perfectly in topological recursion, but in a generalization blob topological recursion. Um, and yeah. Yeah, this is a little bit more. Um, so if you, if you would look at the model where you integrate over all complex matrices, not Hermitian complex matrices, D M star exponential of E M M dagger plus some E tilde M dagger M plus some lambda over two M M dagger squared. If you want to look, if you look at this model, this actually satisfied topological recursion um, with the same with the same spectral curve as the Gross of Wolkenheim model. If E is equal to E tilde, it has the same spectral curve as the Gross of Wolkenheim model and to satisfy topological recursion. So it means if you take the Gross of Wolkenheim model, you have the starting point, your spectral curve, you run topological recursion, what you produce is actually expectation values in this model. It's quite interesting because here you have actually more symmetry. So this rim graphs I have drawn here, they can have additional orientations or whatever. So you have a little bit more restrictions here than in this model. So, and if you forget all the blobs, let's say, just run topological recursion for this model, you get actually this model. And then the question is, so the blobs, all this additional structure coming here is actually those things which are not produced in this model. So some kind of not oriented, uh, how do you call them in the paper? I don't know, oriented rim graphs, or I don't know, or error rim graphs, I don't remember. So this will be included in the blobs here, but everything just for genus zero in this case. We have blob topological recursion, but this we have 
proven that this holds for TR for any genus. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Maybe questions from the Zoom? Okay, so let's thank uh, Alex. Long day. <laughs>